truth or dare. We had dodgeball. And uh, so we have had some, uh, some serious um, uh, games that we preached about. And let me say this. It has been a hit. Every one of them has just, God has just done something. And I would start out sitting in that room in there with some of the staff. And I'd say, Lord, how in the world am I going to preach on truth or dare? My memories, I couldn't preach about really. Uh, and, you know. How am I going to preach on hide and seek? And how am I going to preach on all this? And, uh, but nonetheless, the Lord helped me and used all of that to get us here. I want to encourage you to go back. You can get every bit of it online except truth or dare. And it's not that that message was risque or anything like that, but we had a lightning storm that, that you know, blinked the power and we lost the recording and all that. So other than that, uh, you can get them all. <clears throat> some of you have, or, or some texted me today and said, I, I really want to be there to hear this message, but I had plans already. Matter of fact, Will and Valerie, it's amazing to me, they've gone deep sea fishing today, and they said, isn't it amazing? We have planned this thing for months to go fishing, and then pastor preaches a message entitled, Go Fish. So that's what we're going to do today. And I want you to know right off the rip that God has called us to fish. And I know Brother Eddie Carver just said, Amen. Somebody catch him before he gets to the river. I know he's headed there. God has called us to fish. Now, I heard a joke one time where there was an old man that attended a church, and he always caught more fish than anybody else, and he caught bigger fish. And, I mean, he just seemed to every weekend when he went, he caught a drove of fish. And one day the game warden, John's friend, uh, came and uh, he visited him and said, why is it, sir, that you always, man, you, you never come back with just a little bit. You always got a lot of fish. Yeah, I like to go fishing with you. So he went to his fishing place, and he came to his house early one morning. They went down. It was not this big river or anything, but it, it was a small lake. They get the things together. They get into the boat, and they go out there, and the game warden is kind of scratching his head a little bit because he don't see any fishing poles at all. They push off a little ways, and they talk, and the old farmer grabs a stick of dynamite and lights it up, throws it overboard, and boom! Fish just start bellying up everywhere. I mean, so thick you could walk on them. He grabs a dip net and starts dipping them in the boat. And he goes, oh, oh, man, you can't be doing this. What in the world is wrong with you? This is highly illegal. While the farmer just reaches, grabs another one, and says, do you want to talk or do you want to fish? <laughs> God has called us to fish. Now, I'm not saying we ought to do it like the old farmer did, except for the fact after he blew them up, he did get a dip net and get them out. Are you with me? Say amen. I could go on and on and talk with you about things Jesus said about fishing. Um, Jesus uh, apparently loved to use illustrations, and that's why I love to tell so many stories, because that's what Jesus did. He told parables and I grew up in Columbus, Georgia, right on the, the, the bank there of the Chattahoochee River. Matter of fact, Kelly grew up literally on the bank of the Chattahoochee River. You could literally see the river from her back porch. And uh, I have caught many fish out of that river. I've swam in that river when I had been forbidden to swim in that river because it's a dangerous river. And, but I loved going back there, and we loved fishing. And uh, my cousin, his name was Robert Earl. He lived up to his name. I mean, we... Uh, we got in trouble all the time. I can remember many a night seated on the bank of Standing Boy Creek, which was a creek that came off of the Chattahoochee River, and fishing with chicken livers and just have a big old string of fish, and uh, we just had a great time. He and I used to talk about fishing a lot, and we talked about television shows, and this was in the, in the time frame, you're talking about the 70s and the 80s, and when Bill Dance, how many of y'all know Bill Dance? Come on. Bill Dance is a great fisherman. Now, Robert Earl and I, we come to the conclusion that Bill Dance had a scuba diver underneath the water and hooking fish on for the TV show. Because, I mean, we would watch him, and, you know, he'd fix his hat, whatever, he'd throw something, and it wasn't long, man, whoo, there he is. He, I mean, he's, he's caught him a fish. And he always, he'd unhook that fish before he let him go, and uh, he'd kiss him and then put him back in the water. Now, I remember that very, very vividly. Now, we were always amazed at, at um, Bill Dance because we couldn't comprehend why he would catch this nice nine-pound bass, kiss him on the head, and turn him loose. 
Now, catch and release was a, pro a program that Robert and I knew nothing about. I mean, we didn't release anything. Amen? If it fit in the frying pan, we kept it. I mean, that's just how it was, you know. So we both love to fish. And here's what I want to tell you something. We fish for not only, man, we fish for almost anything. And I'm convinced the world is fishing for anything. I mean, we fish for, for fun. We fished for an adrenaline rush. We fished for the buzz. We fished for the chase. We fished to get away. We fished for the girl. We fi you name it. We and I'm convinced the world is fishing for something. Amen? They're fishing for something. They're wanting something that they don't seem to get. And um, I'm willing to bet you uh, that that many of you probably enjoy some fishing as well. And I would also bet you that some of you are really fishing. I mean, you've actually got worms on the hook and you are really fishing. I'll bet you that some of you are trying to still find something out there somewhere that will satisfy the emptiness and the longing and the hole in your heart. And you're steady casting, man. You're casting it over to the casino, and you're casting it over to the bar, and you're casting it over to the one-night stand, and you're casting to this church, and you're casting to this. Uh, on and on it goes, fishing for something that will make you happy, something that will make you whole, something that will help you get what you don't have. And I believe it's important for you and I as a church to go fishing. Now, stay with me. I'm going to make sense out of this. I think the world has gone fishing. I know I have, and I'm not talking about just catfish, brim, and bass. I'm fishing for fun, fishing for whatever, living in the moment. But here's what I want you to know. The world didn't find what they've been longing for. I never found it in the world. Oh, it was fun. Moses, I mean, the Bible said it was fun for a season. Huh? I remember doing fun. I, I, used to, I still love adrenaline things. Matter of fact, today when I leave here, I'm going skydiving. Uh, I love adrenaline things. It's, it's a lot of fun. Are you with me? I mean, we used to throw rocks at cars just for the chase. And you know, you reap what you sow. It's all come home to me. We used to steal bicycles for the chase. I can't tell you how many bicycles I had to buy my children. Lord, remind me, you stole a few in your day. Y'all with me? I mean, just crazy, stupid stuff. Y'all probably would never do that. I was a preacher's kid. I'm sorry. But, but, but I'm saying the world is fishing and they didn't find what they were looking for in a bar because they fished there. They didn't find it in a casino because they fished there. They did not find it. They went fishing down at the Dodge place and got them a new toy. They went fishing at the Honda place and got them a new toy. They went fishing at the computer store and got them some new toys. They fished here and they fished there and they fished there and here and where and there and all of that. And they still have a longing in their heart that they cannot seem to fix. They got a new car and a new bill. They got new insurance. They got a new motorcycle. They've got this. They got them a new girl. Got them a new guy. Got them a new gym membership. Got them all kind of things, and they're still fishing because they have not found anything to fill the longing in their soul. The hole that seems to be in their heart, they found it. They looked, you know, they fished in the oxycodone bottle. They fished in the Percocet, and they fished in this, and they fished with Jim Beam, and Jack Daniels, and Corona, and Wild Turkey, and whatever else. They fished, man, they fished. They fished till they couldn't stand up. Y'all with me? They fished with the new fling. They fished with the one-night stand. They fished. They've traveled the world. They've done this. They've done that, but they're still fishing. So just maybe, if you'll humor me today... Maybe it's time for God's children to go fishing for them. Right, now, now I want to I show you something here. God wants us to go fishing. Let me just slow down and read something. Matthew 28 and 19, y'all ready? This is the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have, all the things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The Great Commission is that we go fishing. 
that God wants us to go fishing. He said, well, I can't go into all the world. Hey, Camden County is your world. Woodbine is your world. Harriet's Bluff is your world. Homeland is your world. Folkston is your world. Amen. The people that you reach in your break room at work, they are your Judea, your Samaria, your uttermost part of the world. God wants you to fish. Jesus called his disciples to fish. I want you to notice with me in Matthew chapter 4. I come across this while I was preparing truth or dare message. And the Lord says this one will work in a few weeks from here. Matthew 4 and 18. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net in the sea for they were fishermen. Now they were fishing obviously for, for, for fish. And he said to them, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. I will help you fish in a way that is different than you've ever fished before. I'll help you fish. You know, you see right now you're fishing for food where you can eat today. I will, I will teach you to fish so that you can win people who will never hunger again, who will never thirst again, who will have bread to eat that you know not of, who will be introduced to living water and bread of life. I will teach you how to fish for that that is important. I will teach you how to fish for that that has been made in the Imago Day. That is the image of God. I'll teach you how to go get that that I created that has strayed from me. Somebody say, go fish. Go fish. So uh, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them and immediately, and they left their boat and they followed him. So I want to tell you something. God says this. Now, now I, I believe God is going to use Bill Dance's program, but God had it before Bill Dance. God has got a catch and release program. What he says is this, Michael, if you'll go fishing, if you'll catch it, you know, if you'll catch them, we can bring them out of the sea of humanity or out of the sea of sin, if you will, and we can bring them to the master. He can touch them, put his hands on them, unhook them, and release them to really live again. To really be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Well, let me go on. See, I want to tell you something. We are to catch them in the sea of the world. To release them to really live in this life. That they'll no longer be searching to fill something that they cannot find. The emptiness in their heart and in their soul will be filled with him. And the joy that comes from him. Now I want to tell you something. Jesus taught his disciples to fish in the stories that he told. Now I want you to understand something. The Bible says some things explicitly. That means there's no ambiguity. It'll say something like, thou shalt not steal. Clear cut, just don't steal. And then it'll say something where it is implicit. In other words, it's implied. It's, it's not so cut and dry, so black and white, so to speak, but it's implied. Now, Jesus said implicitly that we ought to go fishing. He said it in the stories that he told. He would tell stories like this. Um, he, he would say, the harvest is ready. The harvest is right. Don't tell me, Jesus said, that it's four months and then comes the harvest. I tell you, the wheat is already waving in the field and the master's ready to gather it. He says, and there, there's no shortage of harvest, but the laborers are few. Time to go fishing. Well, go gathering, go farming, whatever you want to call it. Implicitly, he was simply saying, it's time to go fish. In another place, he said, a man left his 90 and 9 and went to search for the one that was lost. Go fish. Are you with me? Say amen. Yeah. Never did Jesus say it more pointedly when he said to Peter and to Andrew, follow me. And I'll really help you to learn how to fish. Follow me. And I'm going to tell you something. When you learn to follow Jesus, you will learn to reproduce what you are. You will learn to influence them. I, you know something? I'm convinced it's not me. It's not my good temper. It's not my, my good character. But it is Christ in me, the hope of glory, that other people say that says, I want to follow after him. You see, um, 
I, I got to show you how. I can't really tell you to do something and leave you hanging. There are places that we fish, and you and I, we, we're right here, we're spoiled. I mean, we've got the, uh, the St. Mary's River, we've got the Little St. Mary's River, we've got the Stiller River, we've got the Turtle River, we've got, we got this river, we've got that river, we've got all these rivers, and man, here we are. are you, amen? And then we've got the big Atlantic Ocean, right? We've got all these places to fish, the rivers, the lakes, the streams. Let me say this, you're not going to go to the ocean to fish for brim. Are y'all hearing me? Nor am I going to run way up the St. Mary's River to fish for whiting. Are y'all hearing me say amen? Now, may I contrast this with the fishing Jesus talked about? We are to fish for men and for women. Souls. I had someone spoke to me in my office just this past week about a church that kind of shunned and sort of forbid reaching out and going out. Let me say this. If we're not going to be the salt and the light of the world, if we're not going to associate with him, how in the world are we ever going to win them? If they look at us and we think we're too good to have them come. I want to tell you something. The most foul sinner can come. The dirtiest sinner. You know why? For such were some of us. Amen. I don't care what they're steeped in. If we think we're so snooty, so pharisaical, so, so Christian, if you will, then we cannot reach to those who are dirty and say, come and be washed in this fountain. If we can't offer them forgiveness, who are we? That's a pharisaical attitude that would say that. Far too long the church has taken the approach of we will sit back in our beautiful $2 million building and wait on them to come to us. Those days are over. They are not coming. We have got to go fishing. They're not coming. Only 60% will come to anything attractional at the church, and most of that's already Christians, or at least profess to be. The Bible tells me implicitly that we are to go fishing, and the church, I tell you, cannot sit any longer and do nothing. I'm telling you, the day, you know, has almost gone. The night, you know, I mean, the day is just about spent, and the night comes when no one can work. It is time for you and I to say, you know what, it's not about my creature comfort. It's not about if I like that particular song the worship singer chose today. It's not really if I like that kid's wing and the $18,000 they spent there. The idea is whatever it takes to reach the lost. I'm not saying that we assimilate them without transformation. I'm not saying anything goes. I'm not trying to say that. We've got to stay true to the Word of God. But if we are so high and mighty that we won't even reach out to them, God help us. If that's the case, we may as well lock the doors and call it quits. Jesus said, I did not come into the world for somebody that's whole or somebody that's got it together. But I come to seek and to save those who are lost. Because the whole don't need a physician. And then there are those that would like to be dressed in nice fine robes and, and, and you know, uh, straw boss everybody else around. And Jesus said this, I have come to serve. Let the greatest among you be a servant. If you feel like you're too good to get down on your knees and do the work of God, whatever that might be, uh, to pray and seek the Lord uh, and to do whatever it is that God wants us to do, guess what? You're too big for your britches. On partnership Sunday. Let me tell you something. I got a boat. I don't know why I got it. Boat stands for break out another thousand. I bought it when my kids was in high school. We loved to ski and to fish and all that. It was all fun. For three years, it sat in my driveway. I crank it every six months. I run it for about 15 or 20 minutes, and I put it up for sale for a little while, and then I forget about it. Hadn't been a fish in it in three years. Are y'all hearing me say amen? What I'm simply saying is for us to say I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, without ever having a fish with us, something's wrong. The boat can sit in the yard from now until Jesus comes. It does no good sitting in the yard. Amen. I can crank it up and make it sound like I'm going fishing. I can hook it up to the... I hooked it up just the other day to move around so I can mow up under it. And I hook it up and drive it around the yard. Guess what? That don't mean I'm fishing. And hey, by the way, you can even put the boat in the water, and that don't mean you're fishing. But are you willing to get your fingers dirty and smelly with that dead shrimp with chicken liver, with cut bait and guts. Oh, no, Pastor, that's a little nasty. 
Let me tell you something. Delivery rooms are nasty places. I mean, I know they're sterilely clean, but I stood there four times, and it was always dirty when we got through. <laughs> Hello? I mean, come on. There's blood everywhere and uh, this and that and the other. I mean, my God. You know why? Because, but, but guess what? Each and every time I heard a little baby start crying, we laid him or her on mama's chest. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. And I'm telling you, when you and I, if we'll go fishing, yes, we're going to get nasty. Yes, it's going to get dirty. Yes, it's going to be hot out there. Yes, the sun's going to beat down. But we're going to bring home some people. Well, I don't know if you're ready for the rest of this or not, but when's the last time you put your boat in the water? See, some people will do pretty fishing. Beach fishing. They'll go to the beach. You know why? I'm up all the bikini babes are over here and the big old stocky hairy chest guys over here and the bald chest guys. Oh, you six pack. Man, you're going down there. And, yeah, I'm beach fishing. Do a little sightseeing. I'm beach fishing. You know, you catch one every now and then. You got you a cold Coca-Cola over here, a bologna sandwich. That's fun, easy fishing. How many of you ever been with Eddie Carver? And he takes you into Cabbage Creek where the limbs hang over your head. I first come down here, I hadn't been here six months, he invited me to go fishing with him. I didn't realize he stayed till dark. Uh, I didn't realize we were going up under the low hanging limbs with snakes falling in the boat. Huh? I didn't realize we was going to brave banana spiders, look like you cover your whole head, the claw on you. Huh? How many of you want to go fishing in places like that? Well, what I learned is we can catch the best fish in them old places. We get in there where things really get tight and you can't hardly turn around. But guess what? There's some red breast up in there. Uh, and man, we're throwing it out there. Next thing, you know, my first six months, I, I, I was squirrel fishing. I was throwing it up in the trees and in the limbs and the grass. And I threw away more of his tackle and everybody else's tackle. You see, because when I come from the river, man, we just hurl it out across the river. It's a little bit different. You've got to be more specific. How many is willing to go to the tight places where there's threats hanging over your head? How many is willing to go where it's... Uh, treacherous and scary. Oh, no. We'll sit in the church and say, we're having Doyle Dykes next week. Y'all come hear him and hope some of y'all get saved. It's quiet. But why not this week go fishing to bring somebody here? And if they, Some of them ain't going to come here, so you got to take it there. It's done got real quiet. I done hit a nerve, man. I done hit a nerve. See, and and y'all buckle your seat belt. It's really, really going to get deep. We prefer certain fish. See, I, when I first met Brother Wendell, my daughter-in-law's daddy, he took me trout fishing. And I, the first time I'd ever been trout fishing, I enjoyed trout fishing. But uh, they set up a certain way to go trout fishing. Man, they used corks that long. I didn't know nothing about that. I thought, my God, if, if we don't catch him, we can beat him to death with his cork or something. <laughs> I had no idea about no trout fishing, but nonetheless, some of us want to do certain kinds of fishing. We want to catch white fish or black fish. Or maybe, maybe we don't care if they're black fish or white fish as long as they're wealthy fish. Or maybe we want to catch Asian fish. Or maybe we want to catch, you know, status fish. It's got to be, you know, how many ever caught a tagged fish? Huh? You know, the DNRs tag them. You know, if you catch them, you get a prize. Some of us, well, boy, we, if we catch a tag fish, we'd be good to go. So we'll be going places where we feel like we can catch a status fish. But the Lord says, I just want you to go fishing. Now, see, now, now that might not have appealed to you, and it might, you say, well, no, I don't care if the fish is black or white, as long as we get them in the frying pan, we can eat. Now, again, we're talking about a different frying pan now because we're wanting to catch and release them back into the world to do the things of God, but some of us want to catch straight fish. Uh, we don't want to catch no homosexual fish. Uh -huh. 
y'all messing with me now, Pastor? We don't want to catch no uh, dark side fish. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about race. I'm talking about people that, that, that are deal, dibble dabbling in dark side of stuff. Witchcraft. And, uh, we, we don't want to catch none of them kind of fish. They're too hard to clean. Certain kinds of fish are tougher to clean than others. The truth of the matter is, for we fishermen, we're supposed to catch them and God cleans them. So guess what? If they ain't straight, we still fish for them. Huh? If they're tied up in the LGBT community or whatever, we still fish for them. We still bring them. We still introduce them to the master where he can put his hands on them and he can change anybody. And whom the son sets free is free indeed. So we prefer trout over perch, sometimes adulterers and fornicators over homosexuals. Some people only want to fish for certain fish, and it's because they're easier to clean. But listen, putting the boat in the water don't mean you're fishing. So what I'm saying is coming to church just don't mean you're fishing. You say, well, Pastor, I got my statement the other day, and I gave $5,000 to the church. Praise God. I'm thankful for that, and God's going to bless you for that. Are you fishing? Are you fishing? Well... You can fish all day. Y'all want you to get this now. Y'all ready? You can fish all day for catfish with spinner bait, and you ain't getting it. All day long, fish for catfish with a beetle spin, and you ain't catching it. You know why? He ain't on top of the water. Typically, he feeds on the bottom. How deep are you willing to go to catch the fish that we're after? Are you hearing me? Listen, there's so many things the Lord just laid on my heart, like fish finders. Uh, you know, our church, I mean, if we call this boat that we're on the harbor, you know, have we got a fish finder? Where are they at, Lord? How deep are they? Where do we need to go? And what type of bait do we need to use? Because some fish are not going to eat this. I mean, they're not going to eat the same things that other fish eat. What I'm saying for you and I as a church, we do have to be attractional in a way. How do we want to reach them? Number one, you've got to go where they're at. They're in the stream somewhere. They're not here. This place ought to be a filling station for you to get right with God so you can go out and do some work. Do some fishing. Now, I understand there's all kinds of ways to fish. I mean, you've got fish finders, you've got depth finders, you've got trolling motors. And listen to me, I understand all that. The live well, and oh, there's something to say about that. The stringer, something to say about that. The rod and reel, okay, but let me, let me go here. Rod and reels. I remember I started out with a Zebco 33. My uncle gave it to me. Loved it. Caught a lot of fish on it. Even caught an alligator on it one time. Yeah, he broke my line. But, uh... I didn't think I was going to get him, but nonetheless, I was going to try. And something to be said for trying. And here, here's the deal. You got uh, brim busters. I even saw, I was fishing with Glenn Warner one time, Sean, you'll appreciate this. And we got into a tight spot up in Stiller River. And uh, you couldn't hardly, I mean, you couldn't manipulate a pole in there. So you know what he did? He spooled him off about six foot of fishing line, tied him a hook on it, a little bit of a weight, put some bait on it and ran that line right down between two or three rocks. I said, you idiot. <laughs> All of a sudden, bloop, pull him up right there on the... I said, my God, a smart idiot. How about, you know? And he actually caught a couple fish like that. I'm thinking, man, you got to be kidding me. But a man knows how to fish. But, uh, I mean, that's, that's how it is. So what I'm simply saying is this. We can use a rod and reel... And, and, and after I started fishing with, with the bigger boat and, and catching a, a few nicer fish, once I learned how, I learned that you better buy you a dip net. Huh? It's just a, you know, it's you know, a pole about like this and got a hoop right here, and you can just scoop under there and get him because he's going to get off if you're not careful. But then... Uh, it's not just the fishing pole, the brim buster, the rod and reel, and, and, and the dip net that you need. The Lord laid something on my heart that blew my mind. Now, some of you men might remember this. Uh, I know Adam was with us. He was a young guy. I don't know if Josh was with us or not. But uh, my daughter-in-law's uncle, Travis, decided one night he was going to take the church men. This was way back yonder years ago. 
is about 12 or 15 of us decided to go to Cumberland Island one night after church. Okay, I want you to get this. This is, this is kind of crazy, but we went, took two boats. We went to Cumberland Island, and uh, we took a seine net. Now, I'm not talking about my last name. It's similar, but a, a seine net, it was long. I want to say this thing was 75 or 100 feet. Now, here's the way I think you and I ought to fish. Because a seine net is where you got somebody on a pole. Let's just say the water's out there and the bank is right here. We went on out. I don't know how far it was, maybe knee deep or something. We set this pole. And then they started that net around here on this side. It went out like 100 feet. And, and you got to have men every so many feet because when the fish start getting in there and then you got the tide to deal with and all that, it can be a bear to hold on to that net. And these guys make a big swath all the way around. All the way around. And they come back around. And by the time they get on over here, man, it's really tough to pull this because you've got fish, you know, up against the net. And you pull it. And then we try to walk ashore with it. And, man, we caught all kind of fish. But what I'm saying about that is this. A saying net's where you can get everybody involved. I, I prefer, I mean, we need to go fishing. And I don't want to just hand somebody a rod and reel. I want you to get on one of the poles of this same net. I want us to try to grab a lot of them, a big swath at one time, and catch some fish. Now, we had some adventures that night, and I don't have time to tell you all of it, but we caught some fish. And here's what you got to understand. If you and I don't fish, we have totally missed the point of the Great Commission. Here's what's at stake if we don't fish. The souls of your friends and their loved ones the heart and soul of your children if we don't fish and catch them they're going to miss the greatest opportunity in this life that they could possibly have and perhaps miss heaven eternal punishment would await them we cannot just come to church it is not enough just to come and fill out an automatic debit and pay your tithe we appreciate that praise god and we're still going to use your money if you don't fish we're going to use it to help reach people. But we want you to grab a pole. We want you to get involved in this with us. What's at stake is future generations. Now, I want to, as I close, I want to read this. It's a story written by J.D. Greer. He's a pastor. An amazing story. I read it years ago, and I had to do some research, but I found it. Here it is. Now it came to pass that a group of uh, a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And lo, they were uh, there were many fish in the waters all around them. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes and filled with fish. And the fish were indeed hungry. Week after week, month after month, year after year, those who called themselves fishermen met in large meetings and talked about their call to fish and the abundance of the fish in the area and how they might go about fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what it meant to fish, and they defended fishing as an occupation and declared that fishing is always to be a primary task of fishermen. Continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing and for new and better definitions of what it meant to fish, and they created uh, witty slogans and displayed them on big, beautiful billboards and banners. These fishermen built large, beautiful buildings called fishing headquarters. Uh, the plea was that every one should be a fisherman, and every fisherman should fish. One thing, however, they did not do was fish. They did not fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized a board who sent out fishermen to other places where there were many fish, and the board hired staffs and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing and to defend fishing and to decide new and uh, uh, and to decide what new streams uh, they should be thinking about. But the staff members and the committee members themselves never fished. Large, elaborate, expensive training centers was built uh, whose original and primary purpose was to teach fishermen how to fish. Over the years, courses was offered on the needs of fish, the nature of fish, where to find fish, uh, the psychological reactions of fish, and how to approach and how to feed fish. And those who taught had doctorates in fishology, and, uh, but the teachers themselves did not fish. They only taught fishing year after year. After tedious training, many were graduated and were given fishing licenses, and they were sent to do full-time fishing to some distant water, which were filled with many, many fish. 
many who felt the call to be fishermen responded. They were commissioned and sent to fish, but like the fishermen back home, they never fished. They engaged in all kinds of occupations. Some felt that their job was to relate to the fish in a good way, uh, so the fish would know the difference between good and bad fishermen. Others felt that simply letting the fish know that they were nice, land-loving neighbors, and, and, and how loving and kind they were was enough. Now it's true that many of the fishermen sacrificed and put up with all kinds of difficulties. Some lived near the water and bore the smell of dead fish every day. They received the ridicule of uh, some who made fun of their, their fishermen's clubs and the fact that they claimed to be fishermen but yet never fished. Imagine how hurt someone, some were rather, when one day a person suggested that those who don't fish were really not fishermen at all. No matter how much they claimed to be, yet it did, yet it, it did sound correct. Is a person a fisherman if year after year after year he never fishes? Is one really a fisherman if he don't fish? I want to ask you this. When the Lord said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. If year after year after year, the apostles never caught a fish, would they indeed be fishers of men? No. Nope. As you stand with me now, I want to ask you, we're here today. When's the last time you went fishing? For souls. I know we're busy with our, our lives and our careers, and, that, and that's okay. But you can be a shining light wherever you are. This, honest to the Lord, your priority ought to be serving the Lord wherever you are. Wherever you are. It's greater than my marriage. It's greater than my, my children. It's greater than my job. It, my relationship with the Lord. Have you been fishing? I want us to pray right now. I want us to all bow our heads.